Well, thank you very much, Gunther, for that introduction. And of course, it's a terrific honor to be here. Uh, and having received the Wiley Award, thanks, uh, Deborah Wiley, for heading up the foundation and for all the emails and organizational things you've done to make today possible. Um, everyone knows that there are many, many people to thank, and everyone knows that as shown in this first slide, um, it's really all about people. It always has been. Um, this is a majority of the folks uh, who've come through my laboratory over the years, uh, all of whom are really terrific scientists and have contributed enormously to, uh, to this field. Um, this was at uh, a Spottish symposium held a few years ago at the uh, at Stanford campus. It was just a great event. Um, and while we're at it, I would also like to add uh, thanks to Indira Greif and Hannah Greif, who are sitting here in the fourth row, uh, for coming all the way out from uh, Connecticut um, in order to hear their grandfather give a speech. Uh, thanks, Indira and Hannah, for coming. Um, this next slide uh, illustrates the origins, really, of what I think the whole field, uh, um, uh, where the whole field com comes from. It's really the uh, area of muscle contraction where myosin was discovered in 1864, and the muscle has been studied extensively ever since. Um, in 1969, Hugh Huxley put forward a swinging crossbridge hypothesis for how muscle works that said that these little projecting heads coming from this bipolar thick filament shown here in red reach across and bind to the actin and undergo some kind of a power stroke that moves the actin filament along a little distance and repetitive motions of this kind can cause these Z lines to come together, uh, which is the basic uh, idea of how muscle contracts. This happens to be the year that I uh, joined Hugh Huxley's lab at the MRC lab in Cambridge as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, and it's uh, just been a wonderful experience for me uh, working in this area essentially ever since. Um, this uh, Myosin-2 muscle-like protein is also known to be in salt, involved in cell division, where it accumulates in the uh, furrow region of a dividing cell, and then um, is involved in constriction of the, daughter, of the mother cell into two daughter cells. As you can see in this image, there's also a number of other myosins listed. That's of more recent vintage. Uh, in fact, the next slide shows that uh, there are many, many myosins. In fact, the numbers up to close to 40 or so um, that carry out almost, that are involved in almost every function that you can imagine in the cell, whether it's Golgi maintenance or nuclear function or endocytosis and so on and so on. But the origins of all these myosins goes way back to the late 1960s and, and early 1970s. So when I left Hughes lab and went to the UCSF in 1971, I thought there were really two major questions that needed to be dealt with. One was, how does myosin really transduce the chemical energy of ATP hydrolysis into mechanical movement? And um, we had the hypothesis put forward by Hugh of the swinging cross bridge. Uh, but is that really the way it works? How can we really show that? And, um, uh, and what are the details of that mechanism. Secondly, what kind of molecular motors are there in non-muscle cells? And so we took uh, an initial focus of developing first an in vitro motility assay for myosin movement on, 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 my, on, on actin, which um, I thought was for sure essential for understanding energy transduction. And then secondly, to try to begin to unravel the molecular basis of the myriad of non-muscle cell movements. And model eukaryotic cells are needed for this purpose. 
In the period 68 to 74 uh, was the initial discoveries of non-muscle myosins. And the first, uh, as far as I know, uh, from, from the literature searching is that Hatano and Tozawa in 1968 uh, had very strong evidence that there's a muscle-like myosin in Myxomyces plasmodium. And Vivian Nachmius looked in uh, that organism by electron microscopy uh, to, um, at, at myosin purified from those cells and, and convincingly showed that this, in fact, uh, has a myosin-like structure. Mabuchi in 73 found a myosin in sea urchin eggs. Pollard and Korn made a very important discovery in 73 studying a canth amoeba where they uh, found an enzyme similar to muscle myosin but not exactly like muscle myosin. And this was what opened up the area of um, realizing that there's a whole family. Um, we, meaning Margaret Clark, who was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab in, in, in the early 70s, um, used Dictostelium discoidium, which was an organism we thought was particularly useful for approaching such a problem. And um, some years later, um, we in fact found, and again, by we I mean Arturo de Lausanne, a graduate student at the time, found that this organism um, uses homologous recombination. That wasn't known before. Arturo discovered this by stumbling onto it, really, trying to do one kind of experiment, but as so often happens, by looking very carefully at all the data, he realized that he had knocked out the myosin gene in this case. Uh, and, and that was the first genetic proof that uh, you need the myosin 2 for a cytokinesis. Uh, however, Oh, and by the way, the myosin uh, 2 null cells could be transformed with GFP myosin 2 and, and rescued, and then you could follow the GFP myosin 2 localizing to the cleavage furrow, driving cytokinesis in suspension. Um, importantly, as I started to say, uh, everyone assumed that you needed this myosin for cell migration as well, and Arturo's experiment showed that this was absolutely not the case that the cells migrated around uh, happily without having any myosin-2 in the cell at all. Uh, we were able to use this system for a lot of work over the years that I don't have time to tell you, but it helped us to dissect this actin-activated myosin ATPA cycle shown in this next slide, where myosin, uh, shown in, in yellow in a weakly bound state, binds to actin tightly, uh, going from this yellow to this red state. And uh, this weak to strong transition uh, is accompanied by phosphate release from the active site, and that's accompanied by a mechanical stroke, we now know, uh, of the myosin head of about uh, five to 10 nanometers, uh, very much predicted by the early uh, hypotheses from Huxley, Hugh Huxley and others. And uh, the head remains bound to the actin until the ADP comes off and ATP can bind, which puts it into the weakly bound state and releases it from the actin. Uh, so you can study the ATPA cycle and you'll get information about the cycle time, TC. Uh, that's important, um, but so is this strongly bound state time, TS. And um, if you look at this next slide that shows a little movie uh, of a uh, hypothetical contractile uh, muscle, you can see all these heads reaching across, being turned on by calcium ion that's coming in, uh, in the case of the muscle, uh, binding to the tropomyosin troponin regulatory system and causing uh, uh, the contraction to occur. So these little white dots are supposed to be calcium ion. Um, it's really all about force and ATPase is only one readout of the force production. What's important in the ensemble here is what's called the duty ratio. That is, what fraction of the heads are bound in producing force at any moment, because that fraction uh, determines what the ensemble force producing capability of the muscle is. Uh, and that uh, duty ratio is 
uh, Ts over Tc. It's the ratio of the strongly bound state time to the cycle time. So the ATP assay is useful, but new tools were needed to interrogate the strongly bound state time, and also to interrogate the intrinsic force produced by the myosin, uh, because the duty ratio in the ensemble determines how much force is produced by the cell. But also, uh, the other thing that's, that's determining how much force that's being produced is just the intrinsic force producing capability of the myosin head itself. How in the world could you possibly measure that? Well, so we set out with goal one being to use purified components to develop an in vitro quantitative assay for the function of interest, which is movement. Uh, and we did that in the early 1980s. And when Mike Sheets was on sabbatical in my lab, uh, we got the first quantitative in vitro motility assay that evolved into the one that you see here, which was, which was created by my student, Steve Crown. Uh, and made use of the fact um, that Toshio Yanagita had established the year before that you can visualize individual uh, actin filaments by fluorescently labeling them with a fluorescently tagged phalloidin molecule. And so Steve used this uh, to create an assay with actin filaments moving on a myosin-coated glass surface. And as you can see here, when you add ATP, you get very uh, robust movement, uh, and this is a real-time movie, and you can get a velocity measurement quite easily out of this. And the velocity is just the displacement of uh, the head, how much of a stroke you get, divided by the strongly bound state time. Uh, just in the next year, Yoko Toyoshima, a postdoc, along with others in the lab, showed that it's this subfragment one head, so-called S1, of the myosin molecule. That's the motor domain. That's all you need for this in vitro motility. motility. And this was incredibly important because it established that the um, S1 head was what everyone now needed to focus on to understand how this motor worked. Um, this was a great assay. It is a great assay. But it still suffers from the fact that it's hard to know for sure how many myosin molecules are underneath that actin filament producing the movement. Um, this, therefore, it's hard to, to really understand uh, in detail what a single myosin head is doing. And we were driven to take this assay to the single molecule assay to a level as shown uh, below here, uh, which we did using laser traps to trap two polystyrene beads shown here in purple, uh, and lower an actin filament down onto a bump on the surface with one myosin molecule uh, to interact with the filament. And then as shown in this next slide, what you see uh, is uh, the Brownian motion of this bead on the left, uh, shown here as an up and down displacement in the graph below. Uh, and then at this point, the myosin binds and pulls on the actin filament, pulls the bead a little bit out of the trap, and you can measure the displacement. Uh, and then at this point, ATP binds and releases that uh, myosin from the actin filament again, and it undergoes Brownian motion back in the trap. Now, if it's a very weak trap compared to the amount of force the myosin can produce, you measure the stroke size, which is, say, 5 to 10 nanometers, uh, depending on the myosin type. If it's a very strong trap, just strong enough to balance the force that the myosin's producing, then you can actually measure that intrinsic force of the motor. And, uh, and we, may, we, we make measurements of somewhere between 1 and 5 piconewtons. So this is a very powerful and important tool in our uh, arsenal. Um, and we've applied it, uh, along with the motility assay and other assays, over the last five, six years to myosins five and six. And we were able to show that these are, in fact, processive motors that use a swinging lever arm mechanism for movement. Uh, and not only studies from my lab, but from many other laboratories around the country and around the world uh, have established, I think, quite firmly that that's the way these motors work. Of course, you can never prove a hypothesis 
you can only disprove hypotheses. So suffice it to say that there's a, a tremendous amount of evidence in favor of this swinging crossbridge um, Huxley hypothesis at this point. Um, other kinds of things that uh, we enjoy doing over, over these years is, is, for example, putting two different fluorescent probes, as Sterling Churchman did, um, onto uh, the two different legs of myosin-5, and then watching them in real time step over one another by a process we called single molecule high resolution co-localization of two fluorescent probes. Similarly, um, we did single gold nanoparticle tracking, that by we I mean Alex Dunn, who was a postdoc in the lab, uh, who attached a 40 nanometer gold particle to just one leg of the uh, of, of the of the myosin 5 and, and as you can imagine when this leg lifts up off the surface and is searching for an actin uh, to attach to again in front of the attached leg uh, you can watch what that what that detached leg is doing and as shown in this next slide what he found is that uh, it's waving about dramatically by Brownian motion looking for that actin binding site and he uh, could say a lot about what that motion was like. So all of these assays have been really terrific, and I guess uh, you could ask the question, well, what's next? So what's next for me uh, is shown in the next slide, and I'll end with just a few slides uh, on this subject. I think that if you've worked in a field um, long enough to get the assays developed that you need, uh, and, and the understanding that you want uh, um, to obtain in that area, then you, you really owe it to society to try to see if you can take what you've learned and apply it to really important clinical problems. And perhaps even uh, to help develop therapeutic uh, approaches to those problems. Now here's one in dire need of a therapeutic approach. It's human hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathies. Um, these are autosomal dominant missense mutations in muscle proteins that give rise to either hypertrophy of the heart, so-called HCM, or dilation of the heart, so-called DCM. These are uh, very common, so HCM alone, as shown in this slide, occurs in one out of every 500 people. That's the most common form of monogenically inherited heart disease. 600,000 people in the US alone. Uh, most common cause of sudden cardiac death in individuals less than 35 years old. In the human beta cardi cardiac myosin alone, there are 302 pathogenic mutations known. So each red dot here is a family that's carrying such a mutation that gives rise to uh, hypertrophic or dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, we know almost nothing about the effects of these human mutations on the biochemical and biophysical behavior of the contractile system. Why is that? Um, the reason is that no one's been able to express this protein in bacteria or baclovirus in order to insert the mutations and see how the motor has changed uh, from the wild type. Um, a breakthrough has been made by my friend and colleague Leslie Leinwand at the University of Colorado about a year, year and a half ago, uh, where she found she could express these in a mouse uh, cell line called C2, C12 cells that form uh, myotubes. And while they're forming myotubes, they'll make uh, this protein being expressed with an adenovirus system. And uh, this shows purified human beta cardiac myosin done at Stanford by Kathy Ruppel in my lab uh, using Leslie's system. So suddenly one can interrogate human beta cardiac myosin, and so this is where we're now putting a lot of our energies. Um, there are also mutations in the tropomyosin troponin system, shown here in this slide which is the regulatory system for controlling uh, the contraction in the heart. And um, 
we have made in the laboratory uh, 10 different human beta cardiac myosin mutations um, and many tropomyosin mutations, troponin T mutations, and troponin I mutations. And we're beginning to characterize these in uh, sophisticated detail using uh, all of these complementary assays. So we can interrogate uh, using um, the VMAX of the ATPase, which gives us information about cycle time. Uh, we can use the ATPase assay in the totally reconstituted system by um, looking at the behavior as a function of calcium, as shown here in the lower left. Um, and we can compare wild-type behavior to behaviors with hypertrophic versus cardio dilated cardiomyopathies and learn a lot that way. Uh, but of course, we can also use our velocity assays to interrogate uh, the strongly bound state time and, uh, and get information about the duty ratio. Uh, and also, we are embarking on uh, using our laser trap single molecule apparatus to get detailed information on the stroke size and intrinsic force changes that may result from these mutations. So um, this is where we're putting a lot of our energy now, hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathies. Um, we have a very good team working on this. These are the 10 folks um, working at Stanford with, along with collaborators, Leslie Leinwand, of course, from University of Colorado, and Ewan Ashley, who's a wonderful cardiologist at Stanford. Uh, I also have uh, a small team uh, and a lab at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore, where uh, complementary experiments um, are being done. Uh, and collaborators there are the director of the institute uh, and a longtime muscle researcher, Vijay Raghavan, uh, as well as uh, Professor Sao Damani, um, who does a lot of computational analysis that turns out to be very useful in what we're trying to understand. So with that, let me say thanks to all my past and present wonderful colleagues. Um, it's a particular pleasure to have received this award with my two very good friends and long-standing colleagues, Mike Sheets and Ron Vale. Um, so thank you guys very much for uh, being friends and colleagues. I think without you, I probably uh, wouldn't be here sharing this award.